This is my fifth video in my AP Biology review series, and it is about the plasma membrane. The fluid mosaic model is the commonly accepted model for the structure of the plasma membrane. And it has a lipid bilayer made of hydrophilic heads, which are opposite each other, and hydrophobic tails, which touch each other, as you can see in the picture and membrane proteins, which have a hydrophobic region, which is within the inside of the bilayer, and hydrophilic ends, which are on the outside of the membrane. So let's talk about the fluid part of the fluid mosaic model. Phospholipids move laterally and flip across the membrane about once a month. So in this picture, you can see how one of them is flipping. Phospholipid tails, unsaturated hydrocarbon tails, allow the membrane to be more fluid, and saturated hydrocarbon tails make the membrane less fluid. So we talked about this in one of the previous videos as well, but as you can see, the saturated hydrocarbon tails are able to pack together tightly so there's less fluidity, but the unsaturated hydrocarbon tails have a little bend in one of their tails because of a double bond. And that bend stops the membrane um, phospholipids from coming very close together and packing tightly, so that makes the membrane more fluid. Cholesterol is in between phospholipids in the plasma membrane. And at moderate temperatures, it reduces membrane fluidity because it limits the movement of phospholipids. Because it's like wedged between phospholipids and it stops them from moving around freely. However, at low temperatures, it stops the membrane from solidifying because it prevents the phospholipids from packing together very tightly because, again, it's between phospholipids. So as you can see, cholesterol is extremely important um, in the membrane's fluidity. And in this picture, you can see the four um, ringed orange molecules. Those are cholesterol, and they're between phospholipids. So now we're going to get into the mosaic aspect, um, and you'll see how many different components make up the plasma membrane. First of which we're going to talk about are the membrane proteins. There's integral proteins, and these are the proteins that are embedded in the membrane. Many are transmembrane proteins, which means they go completely through the membrane. Peripheral proteins are loosely bound to the surface of the membrane. And these proteins, both integral and peripheral, can be used for transportation, help transport hydrophilic substances, because again, the middle of the plasma membrane is hydrophobic, which means that Hydrophilic molecules can't really get through without the help of a transportation protein. They can act as enzymes, signal transduction. In signal transduction, they act as a receptor for a chemical messenger. And once that chemical messenger binds to the receptor protein, it causes a change in the cell. And they're also important for cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Glycoproteins can serve as identification tags, and we'll talk more about that in the next slide. So as you can see in these two images, um, proteins are used for transporting things. Um, you can see how the peripheral proteins are not actually bound um, in the um, membrane. They're more on top of or below, and how the integral proteins go all the way through. Carbohydrates in the membrane. 
So again, like we just said, they help in cell to cell recognition. They're short branched chains of sugar units. When bonded to lipids, they're called glycolipids. When bonded to proteins, they're called glycoproteins. And what makes them so important is that these carbohydrate chains differ among cells. So they can act as a marker that distinguish one cell from another. Even in the same organism, different cells could have different carbohydrate chains. And here you can see a glycoprotein, which is again, carbohydrate chain bonded to a protein. Here's one bonded to a lipid. Plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Nonpolar molecules can cross the lipid bilayer easily because again, the middle portion is nonpolar. But again, as we said earlier, transport proteins help certain polar molecules pass through the membrane. Channel proteins act as a hydrophilic channel for certain molecules to go through. For example, aquaporins are channel proteins that transport water. So again, water is polar. Carrier proteins hold onto molecules and change shape to transport them across the membrane. And you can see examples of um, a channel protein, the one on the left side of that picture, and a carrier protein, which will, um, a molecule will go into the carrier protein and then it'll basically flip and the molecule will exit the other side. And again, selective permeability means some things are allowed to come in and others are not. Passive transfer does not need energy to occur. Diffusion is passive transport, and it is the net movement from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. And to reward that previous bullet point, it's basically down its concentration gradient. Many molecules will diffuse through the membrane. For example, oxygen during cellular respiration, it diffuses in when there is little of it in the cell, and it'll continue to diffuse in because as it's diffusing in, the cell will consume it. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane, and as you can see in the picture over there, um, it shows what diffusion is when we have an area of high concentration of um, molecules, they'll diffuse across membrane to areas of lower concentration until there is an equal amount on both sides. And when there's an equal amount on both sides, um, molecules will still be going back and forth, but they'll be going back and forth at a stabilized rate. Water balance in cells. Hypotonic solutions are where the environment has a higher concentration of water than the cell, which means the water will diffuse into the cell more than it diffuses out. Because again, um, in osmosis, water is going from high concentrations to low concentrations. In animal cells, this will cause the cell to swell and lice, which means it'll burst. In plant cells, however, the cell is turgid, which means firm, and this is normal and healthy for plant cells. But keep in mind, plant cells have a cell wall in addition to a plasma membrane. So this is why they um, will have different uh, reactions to being placed in um, the same environment as an animal cell. Here you can see what an animal cell will look like in a hypotonic um, solution, and here is a plant cell. So again, this is because of um, diffusion. The water will go from the outside of the cell to the inside, makes it burst for animals. Next, we have isotonic solutions, which is where the environment has the same concentration of water as the cell. So there's no net movement of water. Water will be moving in and out of the cell at the same rate. In animal cells, the cell is normal in this um, solution. However, in plant cells, the cell is flaccid, which means limp. Here's an animal cell, specifically a red blood cell, and here's a plant cell in an isotonic solution. 
hypertonic solution, as you might have guessed, is going to be the opposite of a hypotonic solution. The environment has a lower concentration of water than the cell. And this means that more water is going to be diffusing out of the cell than water going into the cell. In animal cells, this causes the cell to shrivel. And in plant cells, the cell is plasmalized. So this is when a this will mean that a plant will wilt. It'll die, basically. Here's a animal cell in hypertonic solution, and here's a plant cell. Facilitated diffusion is when polar molecules diffuse across the membrane with the help of transport proteins. Channel proteins we already mentioned, such as aquaporins, ion channels, many of which will function as gated channels, which means that a stimulus causes them to open or close, and the stimulus could be chemical, so like a molecule, or electrical. In this picture, you can see that, um, in this case, um, neurotransmitters need to bind to the channel in order to open it, and then once the neurotransmitters um, stimulate the ion channel to open, ions can diffuse through it. And we also mentioned carrier proteins, which alternate between two conformations. They can also do facilitated diffusion. Next, we have active transport, which is the opposite of passive transport. And molecules are going to be moved from areas of lower concentration to areas of higher concentration. And this requires input of energy, which will usually come from ATP. Carrier proteins are the transport proteins that move molecules against concentration gradient. So we mentioned them earlier because they also do help with um, passive transport, but they're the only um, proteins used for active transport. And these are often called pumps because they're pumping things against the concentration gradient. And it, tr active transport can be used to contribute to membrane potential. And membrane potential is the voltage across a membrane. And energy is stored in the form of voltage. And you'll see what we mean by that in a few slides. Ions diffuse down electrochemical gradients. So, so far we've been talking about concentration gradients, but it's important to note that ions also have an electrical um, force that affects the way they diffuse. So when an ion um, diffuses, it's a combination of the concentration gradient and electrical force. So electrical force would be um, positive, negative, that also influences the way ions are going to move. So a positive ion would want to diffuse where there's negative ions. Sodium potassium pump is a great example of active transport. As you can see, there's a higher concentration of sodium ions outside the cell than inside, and a higher concentration of potassium ions inside the cell than out of the cell. However, they are being pumped against their concentration and electrical gradients. I mentioned in the last slide that pumps can store energy as voltage which is created by the difference in charges between the inside and outside of the membrane. As you can see, three sodium ions are getting transported out of the cell, as two potassium ions are getting transported into the cell. This extra sodium ion being transported out of the cell will store energy as voltage. And later, this energy can be used to do work. A proton pump stores energy by generating voltage across membranes, just like the, the similar to the sodium potassium pump. And for example, it's used during cellular respiration. As you can see in this picture, um, looks a little complicated, but basically um, hydrogen um, ions are getting pumped um, against their concentration gradient. And this pumping causes um, them to diffuse through ATP synthase, and as they diffuse down, they power 
the um, bonding of a phosphate group to ADP to form ATP. So basically, this is what I mean by storing energy. Pumping them against the concentration gradient can power other things when they diffuse down their concentration gradient. And that's similar to coupled transport, which is where active transport is powered by diffusion. So again, we still are working with hydrogen ions. You can see that ATP is powering the proton pump to pump hydrogen ions out of the cell. And as they get pumped out of the cell, they want to diffuse back. And when they diffuse back, they will diffuse through the sucrose and hydrogen ion cotransporter. And along with the diffusion of the hydrogen ions, it'll power the diffusion, sorry, the, the active transport of sucrose. So basically, the active transport of hydrogen ions out of the cell powers the active transport of sucrose into the cell as the hydrogen ions diffuse down their concentration gradient. Bulk transport, there's exocytosis, molecules are being secreted, and this happens when vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, and there you can see exocytosis, um, the vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane and then expels whatever it had inside. The opposite of that is endocytosis, where cells take in molecules and vesicles will pinch off from the plasma membrane and take things in. There's phagocytosis, which is called cellular eating. This is where molecules, large particles, will be taken in. So you can see in the part A of that picture, there's pinocytosis, which is cellular drinking. And it's not exactly water that they're taking in, but the things dissolved in that water. Then there's receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is where ligands, which are just substances out of the cell, will bind to receptors on the membrane. And when that happens, the coated pit, which is, you can see in the picture, those little red droplets, that look like droplets, will form a vesicle and take um, whatever is there inside the cell. And then the materials will be recycled. So those receptors will get put back onto the membrane by a vesicle. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and please subscribe if you'd like to see more.